Hey guys, welcome back to my channel for another midweek mystery video. This week's video is one that I've been putting together for a really, really long time and I'm excited to finally be able to share it with you guys. It combines two of my favourite things to research and learn about, two of my biggest passions, and that is serial killers and LGBT history. Now, I've been scolded in the past in the comments of my videos when I talk about social issues, but the truth of the matter is when a case I'm covering relates to an LGBT issue or gender equality, race equality, I'm going to talk about it and I'm going to shed light on these issues. It's just who I am as a person. People call me a social justice warrior. If me caring about things like this, caring about equality makes me a social justice warrior, whatever the hell that means, then yeah, I suppose that's what I am. I feel really, really strongly about this. I'm not going to make things up, I'm not going to exaggerate things, but I'm going to tell you the cold hard facts and if you don't like hearing these things, then maybe my channel isn't for you. Sometimes hearing the truth isn't always the nicest thing to think about. So here's your warning. This week's case is about the doodler and this case is steeped in LGBT history, which I'm going to be sharing with you. In all honesty, there really isn't that much to talk about for this case because it's a very old one and it wasn't given the attention that a lot of other serial killer cases are. So the LGBT history is A, interesting to me, B, hopefully you'll learn something, and C, I think it's interesting to see the full context when it comes to things like this. And to be honest, if you as a viewer are bothered by me talking about LGBT issues and LGBT history, then that's probably something you want to have a look at in yourself, and maybe you can learn something by watching this. So this story starts in San Francisco, California in 1974. The doodler, or sometimes known as the black doodler, is a serial killer that's operating in California at the time, alongside many other serial killers that are in California at this time as well. People just seem to flock there for some reason. It's believed that the doodler killed 14 people, but the numbers on this are a little bit dodgy. We only have five confirmed names, and we're just going by what the police say for the rest of the numbers. It's widely thought that the doodler's number was actually a lot lower than 14, but the police may have mistakenly, or on purpose, attributed other murders to the doodler at this time. So it's San Francisco, 1974, and the majority of these murders are focused around the Castro District, the gay village of San Francisco, and still today is very much synonymous with gay activism and culture. It's estimated that in the 70s in San Francisco, there was anywhere between 60,000 and 90,000 LGBT people living in the city. This number, of course, is a very wide range, it's a big approximation, because you'll never really know. But they are the kind of average numbers that people tend to go for. But the majority of these people, if they were out of the closet, focused in the Castro district. People tended to flock to San Francisco and then the Castro district from all across the country due to San Francisco's more liberal lifestyle. The Stonewall riots had happened in New York just a few years earlier, in June 1969, which sparked a movement that spread across the entire country and then the world. The LGBT community in New York were fed up with being treated like lesser, like they weren't worth as much as straight people. And so one particular night, there's a police raid on the Stonewall Inn. Stonewall Inn was a gay bar, gay club in New York in the West Village and a lot of gay people would flock there and police raids are something that happened pretty often. They would come in and make everyone line up against a wall where they'd take everyone's ID, occasionally arrest people. You had to be wearing a certain amount of clothes that were assigned to your gender. But one night after a particularly rough raid on the Stonewall Inn, the patrons decide that they've had enough. A lesbian is being arrested and she is shouting at people to do something and then a tra black transgender woman, or sometimes referred to as a drag queen, nobody's 100% sure, Marsha P. Johnson picks up a brick and throws it. And this sparks a riot in the West Village that lasts for six days. This sparked a change which is still in motion today. LGBT people were no longer content with hiding in the shadows. And so this is the birth of gay pride. I do totally intend to do a full video on the Stonewall Riots one day. I really want to start moving my content in the direction of history as well as true crime stuff. Um, so let me know if that's something you want to do, but do keep your eyes out. I will definitely do a full video on the Stonewall Riots one day because it is maybe my favourite event from history. Um, so the first ever gay pride marches take place one year later to sort of celebrate the birth of this movement. The marches take place on June 28th, 1970. Coordinated marches across the USA. There's one in New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, 
and San Francisco. Just a small fun fact here, if you go watch the New York Gay Pride March that still happens every year on the same weekend in June, they will be marching the exact same route that they took in 1970. Every year, it's the same. Of course, since 1970, the gay liberation movement has spread across the entire world and new prides take place every single year in brand new cities. So many people, gay and straight people alike, attend at LGBT prides and festivals today all around the world, which is incredible. But it's shocking the amount of people that don't know the origin story here. They don't know their own history. And now you know, so consider this your teaser for a full length episode one day. The Castro first began to be identified as a so-called gay village in the late 60s slash early 70s with LGBT people just flocking to the community, like I said, from all over the country. And in a small but powerful act of defiance, a gay bar in the area called the Twin Peaks Tavern actually became the first to remove its blackout windows. All gay bars, all gay stores had to have blackout windows so people wouldn't be offended when they looked inside. But this bar takes out their blackout windows and just puts in regular windows, allowing the whole world to see inside. There were plentiful gay bars, clubs, pubs, restaurants, alongside safe spaces for lesbian women, bisexual people and trans people alike. The Castro was a relatively safe space for the LGBT community until the doodler came along. It was 1.57 a.m. on January 27th, 1974, when a body was found on the water's edge of San Francisco's Ocean Beach. The body was that of 49-year-old Canadian Gerald Kavner. He'd been stabbed multiple times and had tried to defend himself, shown by defensive wounds on his left hand. He showed only the very beginning signs of rigor mortis, so he really hadn't been dead for very long when he was found. He was found fully clothed, he still had money in his pocket, about $21 in cash in his pocket, and he had a watch on his wrist. Now nothing I read alluded to him being sexually assaulted at any point, and he clearly wasn't robbed. So the motive here wasn't sexual assault, it wasn't robbery, they just wanted to kill him. At first the police had no idea who this guy was, he had no identification on him, so he was known as John Doe number 7 until they eventually found out his name, Gerald Kavanagh. He worked in a mattress factory and was never married, as was identified by the coroner. The second identified victim was found on June 25th, 1974, by a woman who was walking around Spreckles Lake in Golden Gate Park, and she spots this body in the bushes. It was 27-year-old Joseph Stevens, who was actually known as Jay to most, and he'd been stabbed three times in the front and back and once again had only died very shortly before he was found. Now Jay was very well known around San Francisco, particularly the Castro district, because he was a very popular female impersonator he's referred to in all of the articles. He was basically a drag queen um, and he held a job as a performer at a place called Finocchio's, which is actually an old time club that had been around since the early 1930s. So he had like a very good spot in a very good place to work. Now seeing as Jay was very popular, everyone knew him, it didn't take them that long to identify him. He was actually seen leaving the cabaret club in North Beach the previous night, but there's no mention to any of the sources I read as to whether he was with somebody else or if he was on his own. The police actually theorised that Jay drove his murderer there himself. It's worth noting that the body of each victim of the doodler wasn't really moved. If they were moved, it was a few metres at most. The doodler went to no effort to hide the bodies or conceal anything. He would just murder and escape, leaving the bodies lying there to be found. You're probably wondering where the name The Doodler came from. It's a very unusual name for a serial killer. Now, The Doodler, who was also known as The Black Doodler, was actually a black man, most likely, who would sit in gay bars or restaurants, and he would sit there doodling, drawing pictures of his victims. The victims-to-be would then approach him because they'd make it quite obvious that he was drawing them, they'd strike up some kind of conversation, and the victims would always agree to go with him somewhere, maybe to get a professional portrait done, maybe for a little rendezvous. I mean, it makes sense that gay men wouldn't want to be courting in the public eye, they'd want to go somewhere more private. So the doodler would coerce them away from the bar or restaurant and then kill them. The third victim comes on July 7th, 1974. A body is found on the beach by Lincoln Way, and this was Klaus Christmann. He was 31 years old, he was a German national, and had actually only been in the city for three months. He was staying with friends. His body was discovered by a dog walker who actually returned home immediately and called the police and told them what she'd found. Now he was found in a very 70s getup. He was wearing a tan leather jacket, ankle boots with a brown Cuban heel, an Italian shirt, bikini style briefs, a moonstone ring, 
and a wedding band. Now, once again, there was no sign of sexual assault or robbery, and he was actually found to have a makeup tube in his pocket. Now, I don't know what a makeup tube would have been back in the 70s. Could have been like a tube of concealer or foundation or maybe it's something completely different. But from this, the police concluded that he had homosexual propensities. Klaus's throat had been slashed in three places and he'd been stabbed at least 15 times, again in the front and back, the doodler's usual MO. Now, Inspector David Toshi, who is actually a name you might recognise, he was one of the lead investigators on the Zodiac case. I'll link that video down below if you want to go watch that. That's one of my favourite videos I've ever made. Um, David Toshi actually said that this was one of the most vicious and cruel stabbings he had ever seen. Now, imagine this guy who has worked on some of the most prolific cases in California history, San Francisco history. He must have seen some things. For him to say that Klaus's death was the most violent, then you can only imagine how bad this must have been. The Sentinel newspaper reports that the police are aware of the similarities between the three murders at this point. All three involved the victim meeting somebody who suggested driving to a more remote location. All three were stabbed viciously in the front and the back, and all three were stripped of their identification. Klaus took a while to identify due to the fact that he was actually foreign, but it was no shock to the police when they discovered that he was married with two children. Now, they weren't with him in San Francisco. His wife and family were back in Germany, and Klaus was in San Francisco. He was staying there with friends, and nobody really knows why he was there. Maybe it was marital problems, maybe he was there on business, but what we do know is that Klaus was definitely hanging around in gay areas in San Francisco so maybe we can assume there was marital problems. Klaus's body is later shipped back to Germany so his family can bury him. Now obviously as you can imagine at this point the gay community are getting very fed up with the police's apparent lack of work on this case because it's now very clear that there's a serial killer at work. I mean it wouldn't have only been these three victims I've spoken about at this point. You've got to remember that they've attributed 14 murders to Doodler so there were more happening alongside other murders as well. Other gay men, lesbian women were getting murdered all across San Francisco. Now I'm not saying by any means that the police were doing nothing on this case, they were doing what they needed to do, they were finding the victims, doing the autopsies, finding out who they were and then that was kind of it. They weren't really putting much work into finding the killer. As you can probably imagine, the amount of homophobia within the SFPD at this time would have been huge as it would have been within any police department across the country. And finding out who was killing the gays just wasn't necessarily a priority for them. There were no openly LGBT people in the San Francisco police force and therefore there was nobody pushing for this case to be solved. One sergeant in the force though did actually have a regular column in the Sentinel and they actually used the murder of Jay Stevens to strike up a conversation about the amount of gay murders that was happening in and around San Francisco at the time. And as you can probably imagine, this went down like a lead balloon with his colleagues, with the readers. People weren't interested in reading it. People thought it was vulgar that they were talking about gay issues in the newspaper. But in general, the Sentinel was the main paper that covered most of the doodler killings. And obviously other gay publications were covering it as well. But there were, there were other newspapers like the San Francisco Chronicle that just pretty much ignored it. The San Francisco Chronicle didn't write anything about these murders until after they'd finished when it was too late. And even in this article that was too late, the paper linked the murders to leather bars and bathhouses, saying that, well, if you hang out at these places, then you are probably gonna get murdered. It made it seem like the victims had been asking for the crimes because of where they hung out. And they're also publicizing the places that gay men were spending their time, leading to an increase then in homophobic murders and attacks, because now the straight people, the homophobic straight people, knew where to find the gay men. It was the same kind of storyline that came along with the murder of sex workers. I mean, even now you read an article about sex workers getting murdered in the Daily Mail. God knows why anybody's reading the Daily Mail, but you scroll down to the comments and you read them. It's just people saying, well, like, well, they deserved it. They're putting themselves in that position, then they deserve to get murdered. That was the exact viewpoint that people had about the gay murders happening in the 1970s. Apparently it just came with the territory. People were making the choice to be gay and therefore they were going to have to deal with the consequences. And it also links back to the long held stereotype of gay men being promiscuous. If you're putting yourself out there sexually, then you're going to get murdered. I mean, why is that a thing? Why is nobody allowed to be openly sexual other than straight white men? The general thought was that homosexuals were of bad moral character and emotionally unstable and therefore nobody wanted to help them, nobody cared. The police were doing the bare minimum here. They're doing what they needed to do. 
but they weren't putting any actual effort into it. When the killings first began, it had literally only been a matter of months since psychiatry had stopped referring to homosexuality as a mental illness. So obviously a huge amount of population still thought of homosexuality as a mental illness, which we all know that it's not. I mean, sadly today you even come across people who still think it, it's a thing. I mean, for all intents and purposes, homosexuality, or as it's referred to as same-sex sexual intercourse, wasn't fully legalised across the USA until 2003. 2003, that's insanity. After the murder of Klaus, the doodler actually goes quiet for almost an entire year. This is until 32-year-old Frederick Elmer Capin was found by a hiker behind a sand dune on May 12th, 1975. Now, Capin was six foot tall, but he was incredibly slim, like probably skinny for his height. He would only weigh 148 pounds. Now, he was fully dressed when he was found. His jacket and shirt were soaked in blood. His cause of death was stab wounds to the aorta and the heart. And once again, he had been stabbed in both the front and the back. And there were sand marks in the dunes, which made it look like he had been dragged to where he now lies. Whereas identifying the rest of the victims took quite a lot of time, Frederick was identified almost immediately due to the fact that he was in the military, he was a nurse, he was a medical corpsman in the Navy, and he'd even received a medal of commendation for saving four men under fire in the Vietnam War. He was a war hero. But as he was registered as a nurse in California, his fingerprints were held by the state and therefore he was identified immediately. The final murder was that of 66-year-old Swedish immigrant Harold Goldberg, who was found on June 4th, 1975 on a Lincoln Park golf course. And he was actually found in a very decomposed state. He was lying there for about two weeks before he was found. He had been slashed in the neck and whilst nothing I read specifically states it, we can assume that he was also stabbed in the front and back to match the MO of the doodler. Now Harold's death is slightly inconsistent with the rest because he was far older than the others. His trousers were found unzipped and he wasn't wearing any underwear, which suggests that he may have been sexually assaulted, but his trousers were on. It was just his underwear that was gone. So maybe he just wasn't wearing any underwear that day. It's very possible. And also the fact that it doesn't mention anywhere that he was stabbed front and back leads people to think there may be inconsistencies here again but I can only assume that he was if he has been put down as a victim. And after this, the murders just stopped. The doodler went quiet. And like I mentioned before, it's important to remember that it wasn't only five victims. They think there's up to 14. Five months after the last murder, the SFPD finally released a composite sketch of the suspect. And they also managed to release some very specific details about this man. And you can assume they spoke to many, many witnesses to get all this information. Now this man was known to frequent bars and restaurants in the upper market and Castro areas. He was black, he was between 19 and 22 years old, he was 5 foot 10 to 6 foot and he frequently wore a navy type watch cap. If you don't know what a watch cap is, I didn't, I was very confused, it's a type of hat, one of those very close knitted caps that was most likely worn by people in the navy, just like very tight fitted around the head. Now this man had a serious but quiet personality and he was likely upper middle class and well educated. Now he'd informed a witness that he was actually studying commercial art, which implies he was an art student from a nearby university and obviously he would sit there doodling people and we can assume the doodles were pretty good. Now we know that the doodler drew a picture of each victim before he killed them, we have never seen these pictures, they've never been released to the media, I don't even know how many of them the police have, um, but we can assume they're pretty good. Now the police suspected that this suspect had mental difficulties involving sex and there are many many different ways you can read into this. Take that as you will, I personally read into it as maybe this man was homosexual himself and this is the hill I will die on. I strongly strongly believe that the most homophobic people have homosexual tendencies themselves, whether they're full on gay, bisexual or just have the occasional thought. I strongly strongly believe that the most homophobic people are gay, scared of themselves, feeling guilty, self-hating. Is it really so hard to believe that the doodler was a gay man himself and he was just not happy with who he was as a person? So he would take it out on others who were, who were more comfortable and maybe their open homosexuality would anger him and he was jealous and he would just kill them. The press even went as far as stating that he had sexual identification problems, which to me reads as maybe some gender issue, if you think about it in context of the 1970s. 
and he was undergoing psychiatric care on an outpatient basis. Now this is very, very specific and I'll get more into it later, but it implies that the police know exactly who they're looking at. Now once the police really started to get into the full role of this investigation, one of the biggest problems that they faced was that witnesses were reluctant to cooperate with the police. Although the police emphasised that any information that they were told was gonna be kept 100% confidential, people were scared and nobody wanted to out themselves. I mean, they would lose their families, whether it's a wife and kids or parents, they could lose their jobs. There was a lot at stake. Harvey Milk, who was the first openly gay elected official in the state of California, actually lived in the Castro district himself around this time and he publicly expressed empathy for the victims who refused to speak with the police. He said, I understand their position. I respect the pressure society has put on them. They have to stay in the closet. He then goes on to elaborate saying that they will fear damaging their relationships. He cites that he believes only 20 to 25% of gay men in San Francisco are open about their sexualities. And alongside this, there was also a long held history of mistrust between the police and gay men. I mean, the police would actually go out and try to entrap gay men and get them in trouble. So why would gay men now want to trust them with this? Why would they want the police to know that they were gay so they can arrest them later on? I don't think so. Now, there are actually rumors in the papers of three surviving witnesses three well-known people who chose to stay quiet about this. One, rumour has it, was a European diplomat who apparently met the suspect in an upper market restaurant and the diplomat actually takes the doodler back to his house where he gets stabbed but he refuses to cooperate with the police, he won't talk to them about anything and he just goes back to Europe. He denied any sexual relationships with this man, potentially the doodler, and refused to be named in the press. Another witness was an entertainer who police said was nationally known, um, likely someone who appeared on TV, who would appear in papers, who every family would know of. And this person has never been named, although there is a lot of discussion as to who it possibly could have been. Um, and the third person was a well-known figure within San Francisco who apparently immediately left the city and refused to cooperate with the police. When you're a well-known person like this, you have even more to lose by coming out. I mean, look at Ellen's coming out in the 1990s, I think she came out. She lost everything. It took her three years before she was back working on TV. And this was the 90s. Imagine how much worse it was in the 70s. As time went on, as always happens, the press coverage on the case dwindled and even with the gay publications, the gay publications moved on to the next crisis facing the gay community, AIDS. However, it's at this point that the San Francisco Chronicle do the big article on it that I spoke about earlier. The article was actually headlined, The Gay Killers, and it spoke about the doodler alongside other gay murders as well. It went down really badly within the gay community because it put them in a really negative light but it did lead to a lot of tips coming into the police. There was actually one man in particular who the police questioned multiple times over the course of a year, and they strongly believed that this was their killer, this was the doodler, um, but this person always refused to admit to anything. It seems they actually had enough evidence to potentially take him to court, but because none of the witnesses would come forward and speak, they had to let him go because obviously this is the 70s and there was not the technology or the DNA testing that we have nowadays. Why did the murders just stop when they stopped? It's likely that the killer moved on, maybe went somewhere else, changed his MO slightly, maybe they became incapacitated or maybe they died. But it's also highly likely that they succumbed to the AIDS crisis themselves. Even if the killer wasn't gay, which I think they were, but even if they weren't, they were actually coming into contact with a lot of blood of gay men and it's highly likely that they would have contracted the AIDS virus themselves. Although the virus didn't really begin to take hold properly until the 1980s, there were cases seen as early as 1960. And whilst it's hard to know exact numbers of how many people in San Francisco succumbed to the disease, it's estimated that over 20,000 people in San Francisco died of AIDS. And of course, this number would have been disproportionately gay men. In a city where there's estimated to be between 60,000 and 90,000 people in the LGBT community, to lose almost 20,000 to AIDS was to lose a huge percentage of that community. One of my least favourite things is when older people, middle-aged people comment that nobody was gay when I was your age, nobody was gay in the 80s, nobody was gay when I was growing up and the sad sad truth of it is that people are either too scared to come out of the closet or they succumb to the AIDS virus. Think of the amount of stories, the amount of people that we've missed out on because of the amount of people that died. And one of these people may well have been the doodler coming into contact with so much blood of gay men. I do just wanna make it clear though that AIDS wasn't the gay virus as it was referred to so often in the media. 
anybody could contract AIDS. It was just very, very prevalent within the gay community. Even now, when you approach the SFPD about the case of the doodler, the stock answer is that they can't discuss open investigations. This case was never closed and it's still open. They're still looking into it today. And if he's still alive, the doodler will be in his early 60s by now. The case actually got a brand new lease of life earlier in 2018 when investigator Dan Cunningham dusted off the file and is now in charge of renewing the case. After the case of the Golden State Killer was solved last year, loads of these old serial killer files are now being dusted off and brought back to life because now it looks like there's actually chances of them being captured due to new DNA technology. Dan Cunningham is painstakingly going through old articles, old police files, old TV shows, anything that he can get his hands on to see if anything will open up a clue as to who the doodler was. They haven't confirmed that they've got any DNA they can use in this case and if they do get DNA it's going to be a painstaking operation to try and actually find something from it but this case could actually be solved and I really hope this case is solved a community that's faced so much pain over the years deserves a little bit of justice I know this video has been a little bit different from the kind of stuff I usually do but I really hope that you guys learned something I really want to do full videos on Stonewall and the AIDS crisis and I definitely will do that one day but I'd love to know what you guys think of something like that if you enjoyed this please make sure you give it a thumbs up and let me know all your thoughts down below and I will see you in the next one. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe. I'm about 3,000 away from 100,000. Bye, guys.